Hi, welcome to the Hungarian Living Podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Sebo Voss. Our goal is to discover, celebrate, and share Hungarian heritage and encourage you to do it too. We'll touch on food, travel, history, music, and language, and share stories from our listeners. We're glad you're here. This is a podcast where we'll encourage you to dig deeper to learn about your Hungarian heritage in a variety of ways. We'll have thought-provoking conversations and share resources. So whether you know a little or a lot about being Hungarian, this is the place to be. Welcome to this episode of the Hungarian Living Podcast. I'm your host, Liz Subovas, and today I'm visiting with Connie Hampton Connolly. Connie is the author of a book titled The Songs We Hide, which is set in communist Hungary in 1951. We are going to talk about all of that shortly, but first, welcome, Connie. I'm so glad to visit with you today. Thanks. It's great to be here. When I virtually met you this fall, one of the first questions I know I asked was whether you had Hungarian heritage. And of course, it isn't a requirement. And for the record, you don't. But I do suspect you know quite a bit more about Hungarian things than the average American with Hungarian heritage, particularly about that time frame in Hungary. So what led you to write a historical novel about Hungary? I'm sure you had to take quite a deep dive into this time frame in Hungary's history. Sure. Yeah, my interest in Hungary grew out of my love of music, actually. I used to be an elementary music teacher, and while I was doing that, I was taking some teacher training workshops in a music methodology that was developed in Hungary, actually by the composer Zoltan Kodai. And I I really enjoyed the classes, and I began to do some reading about Kodai himself, and also about Hungary during his lifetime. And I was just amazed by the enormous amount of turmoil that the country had gone through. During Kodai's lifetime, there were two world wars, fascism, communism, a failed revolution, complete economic upheaval. But at the same time, yeah, huge. (laughs) But at the same time that that was going on, beautiful music was going on too. And Kodai helped spread that. And I was just really um, struck by that idea of how do you do something beautiful in the midst of oppression <laughs> kind of how how do you sing while you're scared and right. that was the spark for the songs we hide i read this book and i was so drawn in i could hardly put it down and the you know the characters really came to life for me and you know sometimes it it takes a little work for me to connect with the book and i just kind of keep at it and keep at it but i really didn't have any problem here with this with this book so i you know, and because I have relatives that live in Hungary and they lived through this time period, I found myself wondering what they experienced during the 1950s. So it it was nice to have some structure, something to at least get me thinking about what that could have been like. Mm-hmm. So could we take a moment and would you summarize the book so that people get a sense of the setting? Sure. Um I think I'll just go ahead and read the little synopsis that's on the back of the book. And here it is. In 1951, a grim hush has settled over Hungary. After a lost war and a brutal transition to communism, the people live in constant threat of blacklisting, property confiscation, arrest, imprisonment, and worse. In this milieu of dread, the best land of Peter Benedict's peasant family is seized and his life upended. Moving to Budapest for a manual labor job, Peter meets Catalin Varga, an unwed mother whose baby's father has vanished, most likely at the hands of the secret police. Both Peter and Catalin keep their heads down and their mouths clamped shut because silence is the only safety they know. But the two have something in common besides fear. They are singers whose very natures makes the silence unbearable. When Cuddleen starts giving Peter voice lessons, they take an intrepid step out of hiding by making music together. 
Little by little, they tell each other what they cannot tell others. In their bond of trust, they find relief and unexpected happiness. Yet the hurts and threats in their lives remain, waiting. As harsh reality assaults them again, is hope even possible? Facing their hardest trials yet, Peter and Cataline learn to carve dignity and beauty out of pain. Mm, and, you know, that's such a good synopsis because it, it really kind of takes me back now to the story. And I'm thinking about, you know, what what happened, what, what led up to it, what goes on after that. And it's such a nice story. So, Connie, what what gave you the idea for the main characters of the book? Um, well, the ideas, of course, grew partly out of the history that I was working with and what was going on at the time. So I, I did want to write about a peasant because they were so heavily impacted at that time by uh, the transition to collectivized farming. But fiction really revolves around conflict and change because that's how stories are built. And so my characters are two people undergoing an enormous amount of change. Peter is a young man that's had change forced on him because with collectivized farming, peasant life would be changing forever. So I wanted to write about a person dealing with that. So Peter is a shy young man having to step into a totally unfamiliar environment, and the survival of his family depends on him. Cuddling is a young woman with more advantages that, than Peter because she comes from a middle-class background. She's had a better education. She has classical music training, but she has become pregnant and had a baby, and the father disappeared during a political purge. And so the grief and the fear that she's dealing with is very difficult. And she faces a very uncertain future, and in and in some ways not all that different from uh, young right. women in America who are suddenly facing a future, raising children, and not sure the father is going to be around. And so, but I really, I really felt as I wrote the story, I felt very close to both of them uh, because of the struggles that they were going through. And I and I know that this involved. It involved quite a bit of research. And how did that research impact the direction you headed with the story? It did involve a lot of research. <laughs> I, I read a lot of books of different kinds. Also watched films, listened to music. I got to travel to Hungary several times, and that was just invaluable. I, I saw Budapest. I, I walked around the neighborhood uh, that I had in mind for my characters. Also got out into the countryside, and that was crucial for my understanding of, of Peter as a farmer. Mm -hmm. But I think what really, what really made the difference for this story was that I had the opportunity to interview some Hungarians who had lived through this time period. They're, they're most of them here in the U.S. now, uh, having come over, most of them during 56 or 57. Mm -hmm. But listening to their stories, it just made everything so much more personal. You know, these, these were not just facts in a book. These were... Um, problems that the person sitting right across from me had actually dealt with. And so some of the things that they told me ended up in the songs we hide. And in fact, based on some of their stories is how I set uh, the songs we hide in 1951. Okay, so tell tell us more about that setting of 1951 then. Yeah. Um, so sometimes people who know Hungarian history, or at least a little bit about it, have sometimes asked me, well, why not 1951? Why not 1945 at the end of the war? Why not 1956 during the revolution? But I really didn't want it to be a story about violence. I I actually mm -hmm. wanted it to be a personal story and a musical story set during just the daily despair of um, that that time period. 
1951 was really hard for the people of Hungary for a number of reasons. It was um, six years after World War II, which Hungary lost. Um, by then, the communists had completely consolidated power. The party chairman, Rakoshi, was answering to Stalin and, in, in fact, uh, called himself Stalin's best disciples, which shows you something about the um, priorities. And there was this terrible network of snitching to the secret police, which mm -hmm. created just this horrible aura of distrust in the country. And then in addition to that, there was horrendous pressure uh, brought to bear on people that were considered class X. And that included, for example, um, former officers of the Hungarian army, former business owners, former members of the aristocracy, intellectuals, even wealthier peasants. And so some of the people that I interviewed had come from that kind of background the that were styled class x well i found out both through them and also through the reading that i did that in may and june of 1951 the government expelled thousands of class x people out of the cities and forced them to go live in the countryside so they were sent out to um uh, far off villages and were required to move in with peasants it was it was a punishment for those particular peasants too and then the houses that they moved out of uh, the houses in the city were then given to government officials mm -hmm. so i talked with some people who were affected by this one woman when she was 18 about to graduate from high school uh, her family was forced to move to a village way out in, in eastern Hungary, and they moved in with some peasants. Um, another woman that I talked to, in fact, Helen Sabia, whose books you carry, mm -hmm. she got married at age 16 to try to avoid a scenario like this. And so when these people told me those stories, I just really wanted to... Uh, put that into the book. So mm -hmm. it became an, not the main thread of the story, but an important subplot. So that's pretty much how I chose the year 1951. Okay. And, and how, as you were working through the process of the book, how do you feel like this topic and the, the setting and the conversations that you had with people, the interviews, how do you feel like that changed you as a person, as an author, or the mm -hmm. direction of the book, those kinds of things. Yeah, in a, in a way, it was something that, uh, looking back on, I can see how it really had an effect on me. And I think the biggest is that it, it really took me out of my American mindset and had to teach me a lot about how other people live and think and the things that they have had to deal with that very often we have not. Historical fiction, well, writing any kind of fiction is a huge exercise in empathy because you have to take on the thoughts and the heartbeat of the characters. But with historical fiction, it's even more of a challenge because you have to uh, not only put yourself into their head, but also into their their time period, the place mm -hmm. where they live, the culture that they are part of. And so I had to deal constantly with adjusting my thinking as I was writing the story. You know, every time right. my characters had to solve a problem, and they had a lot of problems. So sure they did. They were, uh, you know, my my quick fix also always was, you know, the first thought was to solve it the way an American would. But that simply was not something was available. Um, they had very few freedoms, very few resources, didn't know who they could trust. And mm -hmm. so I had to be constantly thinking about, okay, what would they do? And it was really very uh, complex sometimes. And it gave me 
a real sympathy for people who live in countries that are poor or troubled um, because they just don't have the quick answers that we often do. Uh, I should mention that at the time that I was writing this, two of my three sons were living in other countries, in mm-hmm. third world countries, in fact. And so uh, between my characters and my sons, I I just really um, became very aware how much of the world doesn't think like modern day America. And that was a really significant takeaway. Mm-hmm. I imagine so. You know, even just with the kids themselves, you know, that's one thing. But then also to be portraying it in a in a book is is another, and how they actually can come together, right? To be able to do that and yeah. make a change on you, yeah. So for sure, um, what what kind of feedback have you received from those who have read the book? Well, I've been grateful how positive it's been. Um, people have really related to the book, even though it's this is not a place where they live, most of them. Most of the readers have been American, but they really come to care about the characters. They're moved by the story. They get caught up in it, which I'm, as an author, of course, I'm very glad to hear. It's been terrific to hear from Hungarians because they, they said they felt that the book is very accurate in its portrayal mm-hmm. of life under Stalinism. Um, they also have felt that it captures Hungarian culture. One woman told me, and you can, you can imagine how much this meant to me, she, she said, I would not have guessed that the author wasn't Hungarian. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, after having worked so hard for that kind of authenticity, I was just really pleased to hear that. Um, Americans have told me that they they liked learning a lot about Hungary from reading the book. I think for some of them, this kind of put Hungary on the map. They really knew very little, and so this this showed them something about it. But a very frequent comment that I've heard from Americans is that they're naturally um, appalled by the Soviet oppression mm-hmm. in the story. And they comment, I just didn't know how bad it was. And I've I've heard that comment often enough now that it's made me very aware that the struggles of Cold War Europe really have have not been part of American consciousness for quite a while now. And I I feel that that's a lack in in what's being taught and what's being remembered. Yes, and it also doesn't help us as we try to relate to this right. population of people that came over and yeah. and what's in their family history and why exactly you know what the influences were and and those kinds of why they think or do the some of the things that they might do it, it certainly had an impact on them as it would any of us so yeah yeah so you you offered to read the first scene of the book and I think it's a wonderful idea so. Go ahead and do that, please. Okay. So the the title of the book, as we've said, is The Songs We Hide. Chapter 1, The Train to Budapest, Hungary, 1951. Six years after the war was lost, the spring harrowing still turned up bullets and mortar shell pieces in the fields every March. The farmers of Hevesh County had grown used to this happening. The war's detritus was easier to live with than the shortages that should have ended by now, easier to deal with than the produce quotas for the good of the people. Peter Benedek, 22 years old, kicked away a gray shell fragment as he led two plow horses up the long, narrow field of newly sprouted wheat. His father paced behind, anchoring and guiding the weed harrow. Not loudly enough for his father to hear, Peter sang to the mare beside him. She was temperamental since the war, and today she was teamed with a borrowed gelding. The mare's left ear turned toward him. Then it pricked forward toward the road. 
Peter eyed the source of the noise in the field's far end. With a muddy rumble, a black motor car pulled into view. A state car. There was no other kind here. Peter stopped singing. He looked over his shoulder at his father. Appa. With a small pitch of his head, Peter indicated the road. They watched the car pull aside and break. The doors opened and three figures climbed out. Peter halted the horses. His right hand gripped the reins too tightly and he made himself ease up for the sake of the mare. Three of them this time, Appa muttered. The men crossed the road, a grim triangle, their forms blurring in the mist, then sharpening as they drew closer. Peter envied them their long, warm coats. He recognized all the men. In back, the squat deputy, who had once been police chief here, and then the hulking younger man who had taken his job. In front walked Tomas Martin, the local party secretary who ran the communal farm. Peter remembered when the man used to share crop barley. The three stopped a few meters away. Martin touched one hand to his fur cap and gave a nod in greeting. Freedom! Peter glanced at his father. Appa only brushed a finger over his graying mustache. His gaze moved between the three men. The police chief set his hands on his service belt and drew back his shoulders. Peter tried to catch Appa's eye. Speak! Appa did not speak. Peter lifted the brim of his cap and summoned the saliva to his dry mouth. Good day, comrades. Tomash Martin threw Peter a look but turned back to Appa. Yanchi Benedict. Martin swept a gloved hand in a downward arc, left to right. This is not your land. Peter's chest pulsed hot. Appa's hand dropped from the harrow. What? Martin gestured toward the west. The fields there belong to the collective farm. I know, Appa said. Martin pointed toward the stream to the east and the field that lay this side of it. And also there, he said. No, Appa said, that's Jakob Kozma's land. Kozma joined the collective yesterday, Martin said. He is supporting the economic plan. Appa stared at Martin. So you see, Martin said, there is collective property on either side. The economic plan calls for communal farms to have contiguous land. The collective will work this land now. He jerked his thumb toward the lower field that had belonged to Jakob Kozma. There is yours, he said. Peter had walked that land. A good third of it was nothing better than pig mud. His hand closed taut on the reins. The mare tossed her head. The gelding sidestepped. The harness jerked. Peter clutched the mare's halter. Ho! he ordered the horses, hearing the choke in his voice. Appa grasped the harrow again. My son and I already planted this field, he said. We have work to do here. Peter, forward, go. But the big police officer in back pulled the billy club out of his service belt and thumped it in the palm of his hand. Work this land if you want to, citizen, but the harvest belongs to the collective. The three turned and walked away, with only the short deputy turning once to look back. Peter did not move the horses forward. He stood with his father among the green shoots of this lost land. He knew its every ridge and pit, knew the desperate hopes that he and his father and his grandfather had sown here year after year. Beside him, his father gazed over the field in silence. Peter wanted to speak, but the words would not come. When the car drove off and the drone of its engine faded, there remained only the sounds of a distant crow, and now and then the stamping of the horses. Hmm, such powerful imagery there. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you really dug into a lot of details, even the horse details and 
just a lots of little things that, you know, you just don't, as a somebody watching something, you might pick up some of those things, but since I can't watch it, then, you know, the, the description of it really sets, sets the stage for it. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. It was very nice. I, I, I know I need to go back and read it again just to, to glean more the second time. So mm -hmm. how long did it take for you to write this book from start to finish? Um, yeah, it's a little bit hard to estimate because I had a couple different things going on at the same time that I was working on this, and it involved a lot of research. Um, and I often had to set the project aside. But I would say that from the beginning until actual publication was about eight years. Wow. That's, yes. a, that's an investment <laughs> of time. <laughs> And and honestly, um, if I had known how long it was going to take and how difficult it was going to be, I probably would have been scared off. But I'm glad I didn't know. I'm glad I went ahead and did it. Sometimes ignorance is better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this story was written during such a challenging time in Hungary's history. How did you build hope into the story? The music has a big part of that. And really, in my mind, that's one of the things that the arts are for, is that it, the arts are beautiful and beauty lifts our spirits. And I think it was truly that way for Peter and Catalin and for them to be involved in something good, something creative, that gave them moments of joy. But I think the other thing that really gives hope to the story is is the relationships. As I've mentioned, this was a time when there was an enormous amount of distrust in the country and, and friendships and, and family relationships and work relationships were terribly strained by that. But I wanted to show how when people did trust someone, they would dig in and, and commit. And so the hope, I think, in the story comes from the characters knowing that at least somebody has my back and at least somebody wants to help. And the mm -hmm. sense of mutual help, I think, is is one of the main things also that gives hope to the story. So I have to ask you, Connie, what are you working on next? And please tell me it's another novel about Hungary. <laughs> Well, in fact, it is. And in fact, it is related to the songs we hide because the main character in the one that I'm writing now is the older brother of Katalin in the songs we hide. His name is uh, Antal, and he is a violinist. The new book has a working title of Fire Music, and it's told in two time periods, one, 1945, during the Siege of Budapest, and one in 2006, two generations later. The book is not finished yet, but I'll go ahead and, and read a, just a brief synopsis that I wrote that I think helps communicate what the book is about. One August evening in 2006, Antal Varga, an old Hungarian violinist, is approached by a young American stranger. The woman, Lisa Denman, hands him music that he himself wrote at age 17. Suddenly, Vorga's darkest memories are jarred open, for he wrote this during Budapest's terrible siege of 1945. Lisa, a distant relative, wants to know the music's story, which her grandparents had held back from her. Sensing that the time has come to face old hurts, Varga reopens the music. The siege and its harrowing aftermath are again laid bare before him. Little by little, Varga deals with Lisa's questions as his grandson Christoph translates and begins asking questions of his own. In working through the music together, Varga, Lisa, and Christoph each confront their shared and separate pain. They discover that though hurt may extend over generations, love extends further still. 
and grief can be recomposed as beauty. So it sounds like there's some more hope. Yes. In the midst of difficulties. Yeah. For sure. It's a theme that I wanted to continue working with. Well, good, good, good. And our listeners can order the songs we hide from mudramarketing.com from our website. And they can connect with you at your website, which is ConnieHamptonConnelly.com. And I will put these links in the show notes so that everyone has the correct spelling and can either buy the book or get connected with you as an author. And, and Connie, thank you so much for spending time with me on the podcast. It's been great to learn more about the story, learn more about you and what was behind the project. And I cannot wait for the next book. Thank you. It's been great to be part of things today. And thanks you so much for inviting me. And thank you for listening to this episode of the Hungarian Living Podcast. Contact us for more details on the book, The Songs We Hide, or check out the show notes for more details. And please spread the word about the Hungarian Living Podcast. Hungarian Living is a division of Mudyar Marketing, the Hungarian store, where you can find meaningful gifts with Hungarian style. Check us out at mudyarmarketing.com. And special thanks to Stephen Chichek and the Animal Cannibals for the show music. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Hungarian Living, please subscribe and share this podcast with your favorite Hungarian. Check out our show notes for links to resources mentioned in this episode. If you have a question or comment, email us at podcast at hungarianliving.com. We'll catch you next time.